Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America. Hi, and welcome back to Renewables. Thank you for tuning in this week. I'm your host, David Smart, Senior Vice President of Sales at Biostar Renewables. Very energized and excited about this episode. Uh, I have these products in my refrigerator every day of the week. Uh, my my one-year-old eats them sometimes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, so <laughs> I'm really, really excited to have um, Emily and Peter from Driscoll's. You all uh, probably are familiar with their berries and uh, they're probably in your refrigerator too. And uh, Peter and Emily, thank you so much for coming on the show. If you'll just start with your titles and kind of your roles at the company and then maybe a little bit of background and about your career and, and how you ended up at Driscoll's. Sure, I can jump in if you'd like. Yeah, so uh, my name's Emily Musgrave, uh, and I'm the uh, Organic Regulatory Manager at Driscoll's, uh, and I'm going on uh, nine years. Uh, time, time flies, man, just going on nine years. Um, I've always worked uh, in the organic um, part of, of Driscoll's, um, and uh, my background is that um, I did environmental science, so I studied uh, environmental uh, science in my undergrad and my graduate degree and kind of decided that, wow, you know, farming uh, is a big is a big deal. I think if you want to, you know, be involved uh, with sustainability on the planet, everyone eats food, doesn't matter what you're eating, you have an impact. Um, and so I feel truly lucky and, and blessed to be able to work at, at Driscoll's. Um, I've learned a ton and uh, keep learning every day. And uh, like you, my nephew's love berries. There's three and five, and I'm their berry supplier. I always come over with them. Uh, <laughs> they're the berries. best because you can just pull them right out of the fridge and wash them up. And But, you know, they're just a great quick snack. Thank you yeah. for that. Peter, uh, if you wouldn't mind kind of doing the same, your background and your role at Driscoll's. Sure. Yeah. My name's uh, Peter Navarra. Uh, I'm the organic agronomist for Driscoll's uh, Global r and I've been working in organics, uh, organic agriculture for a decade now in March. And uh, over the last three years, I've, um, I've helped transfer organic technology, organic best practices from uh, California and Mexico over to our, our European uh, operations as, and uh, Peruvian operations and, and in Australia. So uh, we're trying to get organics out to um, all of the countries that we operate in because uh, there's, there's a lot of demand for it. Awesome. And I'll second and I'll second the fact that I've got strawberries sitting in my refrigerator and I ate a whole clamshell of them uh, last <laughs> night. Yeah, they are really good berries. And my wife is all organic uh, with our fruits and vegetables. So I'm very familiar with the product. Um, but for those of us who are those listeners and viewers who aren't as familiar uh, maybe with Driscoll's or the ones that are, but might not know how far your company reaches um, tell us a little bit about kind of the geography of the company and, and the types of crops you grow and a little bit more about Driscoll's. Sure, I can pop in there. So yeah, so our berries are grown in more than 21 countries and sold in more than 60 countries around the world. And we have a few different um, growing regions. So we've got one that's called Dota, which is Driscoll's of the Americas. And so that includes the US, Mexico, uh, Chile, uh, Peru, as well as Canada. And actually, interestingly enough, about 65 to 70% of organic berries sold in the US come from Dota. Uh, and then we've got Demea, which is Driscoll's of Europe, Middle East, and Africa. We've got DAP, which is Driscoll's of Asia, Pacific, and China. And then we've got Dan's, which is Driscoll's of Australia and New Zealand. So those are all of our for growing uh, regions where we have growers. Um, and then just in case, you know, we haven't covered it, but basically we grow fresh, organic and conventional strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Fabulous. And you have a, an interesting model, um, your, your grower model. Um, and Peter, I thought maybe you'd jump in and talk a little bit about that and what it means and sort of why it makes 
uh, Driscoll's unique? Sure. Yeah, I used to actually used to be a, a, a Driscoll's grower on the other side of the of the fence. Oh, and, cool. And I've I've always really appreciated this relationship. It's it's you know it's a uh, it's a, it's uh, Driscoll's does all of the marketing and 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 sales of the berries, but we also do the breeding. And so we're we're sort of on both sides of the supply chain, mm. and it gives us it gives us a really interesting perspective of the of the industry. And then the big investment uh, and 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 management is done by the growers independently. So we we sell them the plants, they grow the berries, and then we purchase the berries from them and sell them. And so it's a it's an independent, completely independent uh, grower model, which I think I think is fairly rare nowadays. Really cool. I did not realize that you were sort of on the the front end of that as well. Um, that you did the breeding. Is that the right word? That's right. Yeah, we do the we breed, we do the we control the genetics. Awesome, awesome. And I know, um, you, I think Emily mentioned, but Driscoll's does have conventional farming operations and organic farming operations. Uh, there's obviously you know, pros and cons to each. Um, but at, at Biostar, we, and most of our viewers and listeners know we make an organic fertilizer product that we're, we're ramping up into the market right now. So we, we you know, obviously have a focus on organics, um, but curious, you know, from your all's perspective, why do organics? What, what's the benefit? Um, and, and why does Driscoll's, I guess, continue to shift more into organics over the years? Sure, Emily, Emily, you want to go first? Yeah. Sure, sure. I mean, um, so one thing is, you know, I'm actually I'm pretty proud to, to work for a company that, you know, we valued organic produce actually since before the NOP regulation went into effect. Uh, so we've been certified organic for 25 years and counting, uh, which is quite a feat, right? So it's amazing. I don't know if most people know that. Yeah, but Driscoll's has actually been certified organic since 1997. So five years before the NOP regulations were created in 2002. Um, so I, I, I'm super proud of that. I mean, I, I believe in organic growers, organic practices uh, that they follow and just the benefits, you know, that organic produce provides uh, to the community, the environment. Uh, so I'm, I'm really proud that, that we um, offer organic berry options. And for our listeners and viewers, Peter, before you jump in, NOP is the National Organic Program. Uh, which is a sort of a subset of the USDA um, and which came out and, and, you know, sort of put some structure around what it means to be organic, as Emily mentioned in 2002. So really cool. You've been organic before organic was organic, right? That's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That is, that is pretty cool. Um, well, like I said, I've only worked with uh, organics for, for 10 years from my, the very beginning of my career in agriculture. And originally I got into it personally because it was a problem to solve. I worked in, at the very beginning, I worked in uh, organic uh, vegetable production and it was just really, really hard to do it. And so um, it was kind of like a puzzle. But then the more I got involved in it, I found out that it wasn't just um, a different production method, but there was actually there was meaning behind it. And we were trying to do something that was producing something better for a product, a product better for the consumer and while reducing impact on the environment. And so people always ask me, you know, should I buy conventional, should I buy organic? And having worked in both fields and I still, I still do, um, you know, I tell people that, you know, agriculture, if, you, if you're not out in the fields, you know, it, it just looks like, you know, it, it just looks like a mess, but growers, it's, it's almost like, um, the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, where he's doing the same thing every single day. And so one day to the next, it looks exactly the same, but, you know, from the beginning of the movie to the end, you know, he gets really, really good at, at, at that one day. And so for growers, uh, you know, it's really hard to make changes. It's a, it's a house of cards and um, yeah, conventional production is driven by is it's, it's a business. So it's driven by profits and they, and they want to do things efficiently, but for organics, there's, there's more to it. And, and over time, there's there's change, and and they're trying to do something better intentionally. And and I I really like being a part of something like that. That's awesome. And I have to ask, this is actually not in our outline, uh, Peter, but you said that you started 
on the grower side. And so we, would you mind telling us a little bit about, about your farm and the crops that you raised? Uh, well, I worked in um, organic coal crops. So it was, okay. uh, you know, it was like romaine lettuce and, uh, and iceberg lettuce, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, celery. And uh, it was, you know, it's the standard California vegetable production, high intensity, um, you know, rotation doing, we did three and a half crops per year on a piece of ground and trying to work that into an organic system, transferring from, you know, conventional systems to an organic system was, was really challenging. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm sure that experience in the field, if you will, has probably really helped inform your, uh, you know, your career with Driscoll. So really cool. I actually, I didn't know that about you, but, um, and I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but given our nutrient recovery and organic fertilizer technology at Biostar, really since all the, back in 2008, we've been watching very closely the growth of the organic market. And so I just wondered if you would talk a little bit about organics and, and the market and how it's grown. And, and I think we'll get into, you know, where do you see it growing? Um, but, but talk a little bit about how it's grown and why. Yeah, so I can kind of tackle that one and um, I'll try to keep the jargon down. I always, we have so many acronyms, so just oh, let no me worries. know if I uh, Yeah, say, it's the you know, Elon Musk no rule, you, know, you have to explain your acronym, so. I know, we, there's too many, especially in the farming world, but um, For sure. yeah, so just in general, right? I mean, consumers, we've just seen this throughout, you know, all, all produce, but consumers want organic produce in general, right? And berries are no exception there. So, I mean, the demand for organic berries uh, is just continuing to increase. Um, we've actually seen that berries are, uh, the purchasing uh, per household is increasing uh, annually. That's some of the studies have shown. Um, and then I can just say, just in my experience at Dress Schools, right, I've seen this through the amount of organic sales over the years. Uh, since I started in 2014, um, our organic sales have grown tremendously. Um, and we've also seen an increase in organic growers and acreage uh, quite a bit since that time, uh, especially uh, in Mexico. Uh, we've definitely um, had a large increase of organic growers in Mexico uh, just in a short amount of time since 2014. So it, it is it is just, just growing and it's, it's continuing. I, I don't see that going down anytime soon. The demand is there. I think you're right, Emily. We, like, like I said, we follow this really closely and um, I just wondered a little more or, or Peter, but a little more forward looking, where, where do you think it's going? Do you think we'll sustain this growth and, and how do you see it kind of seeping into other sides of the business? You wanna tackle that one, Peter? Sure, yeah, I think, I think that that's, that's a really good question because I look at it sort of from the execution or the production uh, standpoint. And, um, you know, I think that, I think that, you know, as production systems, conventional and organic being the major bookends, right? And there's all these different ones in between. I think, I think organics um, is, is known in, in the community very widely. And I think that we, because we have a national organic program and the NOSB has a, has a good representation and great participation. And there's so many people working on this, making this the center of their careers. Um, and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's, like I said, it's become a household name. Um, I think that, I think that it's going to be around for, I think it's going to be around for a lot longer. That's not to say that there's not, there's not challenges, you know, but I do think that when you, whenever, and I don't mean to sound nerdy when I say this, but you know, we look, if we're, if we're only doing conventional production, we don't, we don't learn as much. If we have organic systems to compare it to, we, we see more perturbations of the same system, or we see our genetics, our, our berry genetics displayed in different growing systems. And it allows growers to expand their uh, perspective on what's possible with their plants. And, and, and that, that helps their, their entire production system and makes them more efficient. Nerdiness is very much welcomed on this podcast, <laughs> Peter. So okay. nerd okay. out. We want you to nerd <laughs> out. That is the goal. Uh, <laughs> Emily, anything, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think Peter's right. And I mean, I really think, and we just hear it throughout, you know, um, all of our internal talks at Driscoll's, but I think really the continued success and the future success of Driscoll's really includes continuing to be a leader in organic berries, right? I think that's just, 
I mean, it's it's really intertwined. I think organics are really intertwined throughout all aspects of, Dris of the Driscoll's business model. Um, I mean, I just, uh, you know, I'm being tons of meetings about maybe it doesn't have anything to do with organics, but organics comes up, right? And it comes in there like, oh, have we thought about this with organic production yet? It, it's really seeping in, I think, to all, all sides of the business. And I, I really think our future continued success depends on, you know, continuing to, to be the organic berry market leader. Awesome. Thank you for that. And um, I, I think if we could just spend a little bit of time talking about kind of convention, conventional versus organic, not necessarily pros and cons or, or benefits of one or the other, but uh, you were kind of starting to touch on it there. You know, how have they informed one another as, as your company has progressed and developed more organic acres? Uh, and Peter touched on it a little bit as well, but if we could kind of elaborate on that, I think that's super interesting how you've learned from one side or the other to inform success. Um, you know, on the other side of the coin. Yeah, Peter, I don't know, you, you um, definitely have some experience in both. Do you wanna, you wanna start off on, on that one? Sure, it, and there's there's a lot to this. I mean, we could have an entire series of, of podcasts on how organic uh, informs uh, Be careful, I might take you up on that, Peter. So. Yeah, there's just, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot to it, but I'll give, I'll give, you know, one really specific example, and that's, um, you know, nutrient cycling. Um, we see we see much tighter uh, um, nitrogen, or we see much tighter coupling between the carbon and and nitrogen uh, nutrient cycling in organics uh, versus conventional. And I think that came out in the the Bowles paper in 2015. I think it was 2015. Um, I'll share you, I'll share that paper with you if you want to share it after this. But Absolutely. what we see base what we see basically is if if in an organic system, if you can build your organic matter. So if you have if you're putting in compost, if you're doing cover crops, then you you don't need as much uh, nitrogen going as an input going into the system as compared to if you if you weren't building your organic matter in your soil. And this, it, there's there's a lot behind that. But in conventional, if we're just putting in lots of uh, synthetic nitrogen forms, then we're always going to need those those forms. Versus uh, if we were working to 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 use cover crops and compost and and build organic matter and reduce tillage, then we wouldn't need as many inputs. That's a that's a really specific example, but there's like I said, there's so many. No, that's that's great. Thank you for that. It it makes a lot of sense. And I'm only half kidding when I say I might take you up on a series because uh, okay. we have hits well on the podcast. So no, I appreciate that. Emily, anything anything you want to add on that one? Yeah, I mean, just in general, I mean, even though so I'm, you know, the organic uh, regulatory manager, uh, when I first started, I realized that most of, in fact, a lot of our organic growers uh, also farm conventionally. So that was kind of cool when I got to go out and start meeting growers. I realized, oh, okay, you know, they might have three organic ranches and two conventional ranches. Um, and so I started learning, okay, a lot of them, you know, first uh, had conventional acres and then transitioned into organic growing. Um, and, you know, like Peter mentioned, like anything, any new endeavor, there's definitely a learning curve there, right? Uh, switch, um, uh, switching, transitioning from um, conventional to organic. Um, but what's interesting, what I like to see is that a lot of our growers that grow uh, organically realize, hey, a lot of these practices really work. So I've seen growers using, you know, organic, organic inputs on conventional fields and using a lot of the production practices like releasing persimilis and other predatory mites, uh, you know, planting uh, beneficial um, plants to attract uh, natural enemy insects, putting up hedgerows. Um, they're using a lot of these same practices that they, you know, they have to use for their organic system plan on their conventional fields because they realized that, hey, they work. And, and so that was pretty cool for, for me to to see, especially inputs, like, wait, why, you know, hey, you're using uh, some of these organic inputs on your conventional fields, and well, now they work, so that, if that's it works, cool. it works, right? Yeah, so that, that's interesting to be able to see that the learning there, and that a lot of the growers really do share that learning uh, between their organic and conventional fields, so. That's really cool, and one thing that Driscoll's does, uh, I didn't realize until, you know, we all had connected, and I think is really cool is, a lot of research and development 
And I think that, you know, it sounds like, and you kind of touched on it there around pest control and, and um, you know, different, different tools that farmers can use. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, Driscoll's focus on, on R and D and, and why that's important and, and maybe some of the challenges that you face or you found as a part of that R and D. Yeah, we have a, I'll take this one. We have a, you know, we have a global R and D department, which, which does all of the, uh, the breeding and genetics, but it also has a plant research piece that has people in all of our production regions. So in every country, we've got somebody looking at this uh, with, from, with a scientific method. And agriculture is really hard to do research in. There's a lot of moving parts. There could be confounding variables or, or multiple variables to every single problem. And so um, it's nice to have this huge um, web of people that are all connected and sharing information um, about this. And we can transfer information very quickly, like just like what we did when we transferred organic practice, best management practices from California and Mexico over to Europe, we saved them, you know, a lot of time. And you brought up uh, pest management. That's a really big one for us right now. And, and looking at pest and disease management within organic systems, you know, it, it has to be a holistic approach. We have to look at the, in, the entire system. And so it, it just takes, it takes more time and it takes a lot of replication in multiple regions before we can say, okay, yeah, we feel really confident controlling this pest in an, in an organic system with the uh, with the different tools with the different tool sets that we have and and sometimes it transfers well and sometimes it doesn't and we have different learnings in that region that then come back to the other one but we we connect these regions uh, really quickly on a consistent basis and that helps us I mean sharing information at that scale is probably one of our biggest assets as a as a large company yeah it's amazing and I can I can only imagine there's challenges you you cover almost every continent, I think. So, um, you know, working through different challenges with different soils and, and different climates, um, I can sure, I can imagine is a challenge and is also super interesting. Um, totally. Really cool. Um, well, I wanted to just kind of, if we're kind of wrapping up R&D, um, just wanted to talk a little bit kind of high level, you know, going forward, how do you envision uh, Driscoll's, you know, organic program developing going forward? I think we've we've touched on this a little bit, but uh, and it sounds like it's an important piece uh, now and and into the future. But didn't know if you just wanted to comment on that at a high level, and then I wanted to get into kind of this community uh, of organics because it's it's quite a community, um, and it's been around for a long time. So. You want to take that one too, Peter? It's kind of your realm. Sure, I'll take the I'll take the I'll take the community piece. I mean, I think um, I think the future I think the future of organics is is uh, is still strong, and I think that Driscoll's is going to grow in that in in that space. Uh, but I think when whenever you have a time when everybody says something's good, when you have everyone that says, "Oh yeah, we're all going to do organics," there's always going to be um, you know the details that we disagree on. And I think that that conflict is really healthy for the for the organic environment. And sure, it, it creates it creates environment for people splitting off and doing other things, and and for not, for us not all agreeing all the time. But I think over a period of time, just like in like I said, this this, uh, this uh, uh, metaphor of Groundhog Day or comparison to Groundhog Day, over time we're getting really really good at this, and it's just making the organic movement even stronger. That's awesome. Thank you for that. And so getting a little bit into that community piece, as the organic industry has grown, so have the players in the space, right? Um, Driscoll's, obviously, you know, you all are a little different because of the way your grower model in a way, um, you know, it's sort of like a co-op. I, I don't, it's, don't necessarily view it as like one giant corporation. Um, who grows everything because your independent grower model, I think differentiates you, but um, you know, millions of people around the world have Driscoll's organic berries in their fridge or, or conventional. How do you think large companies are, are perceived in organics? 
I can I can kind of start off on that one. So that's an interesting question, and I actually think it thought about that a lot as my career has kind of been progressing at Driscoll's. Um, and you know, part of it's interesting because I think a lot of people still think organic growing is just this small growers, you know, growing a tons of diversified crops on a few acres. And uh, that's the interesting thing, right? The organic about organic industry and farming. So the movement started in the 70s as just this small, you know, grassroots uh, movement of kind of a niche small amount of growers. Uh, and that was long before the creation of the National Organic Program, so the NOP and the organic regulations. Um, and just throughout my years, I was actually talking to people that said, you know, during that are, you know, organic growers and certifiers now. And they said, yeah, in the 70s, we were certifying each other. I mean, growers <laughs> were certifying each other. I mean, so times have changed a lot since then, right? But that that was the start of the movement. And then fast forward now, right, 2022, well, it's over a $50 billion industry. Uh, so that's, that's, that's quite a change, right? That's, that's quite, that's quite a big change, but I, I do think, uh, you know, there's, um, that amount of growth. There's, I think there's benefits and challenges. Um, but I, I will say, you know, one thing is it's allowed produce companies of all sizes, uh, to be, you know, part of the organic community and, you know, being supply, supplying customers with, uh, organic products, um, all year round. Uh, which I'm really happy about, but it, it's just, it's an interesting a shift, right? It's it's not the same organic movement that started, but I think all the principles are still there and just continuing to grow and, and get better. But it's a, it, it's a different, it's different than it was in the, in the, in the 1970s, such a small movement. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And yeah. certainly the, you know, as the organic small grains and, and other sort of you know, row crops have, have the demand for those from the organic side has grown. Um, yeah, the, the industry has really boomed. And I think sometimes there's some, you know, internal uh, within the community, some politics around all that. But I think ultimately, you know, to be able to deliver healthy organic food to the masses and at, you know, at a reasonable price, you know, companies like yours are, are going to be so, so important. And frankly, again, to go back to your grower model, I think it's, it's a really cool way of doing it where you can keep, um, you know, thousands of growers across the world focusing on this niche um, uh, that they're really good at. So appreciate that, Emily. Any sense of just, you know, going forward as a community, how can we work together uh, to, to continue pushing organics forward? Yeah, you know, just uh, being involved in the industry and going to National Organic Standards uh, Board meetings, uh, then that, that's the NOSB, and they, you know, inform and advise the, the USDA National Organic Programs on rules and regulations. And uh, it's, it's really interesting, because as you mentioned, there, there is a lot of uh, politics, you know, that that's just the way it works. This is a, you know, it's a federal program. Uh, and I, and although I think, you know, there's, there's plenty of challenges the organic community faces. Uh, but I, I do think, you know, I think we'll get get through them. Um, I think, you know, one thing maybe is uh, focusing on the benefits of organic farming to consumers, industries, growers, uh, kind of inclusivity in our in our messaging. Um, but, you know, uh, as Peter mentioned, right, um, if you go to any NOSB meeting, uh, you will see the passion on, on all sides, right? And there's definitely disagreement, but that's healthy, right? That, that's part of the democratic uh, process created by the USDA National Organic Program, even though, you know, it can be a bit frustrating sometimes, and sometimes those meetings you do want to pull your hair out a little bit, but it, it's part of the process, it, you know, it's the democratic process we live in, so I think, you know, debate and, and having these conversations is, is really healthy, it, it's what needs to be done, but I, I also think, you know, just coming together and focusing on the commonalities that, that bind organic growers together. Celebrate how far the industry has come. I mean, when we hit $50 billion in industry, that's a pretty big deal considering where you, when we, you know, how it started in the 70s. So I think, um, you know, uh, just not, not, not just dwelling on, on you know, the, the differences, celebrate them, those are healthy, but, but really just coming together and focusing on the commonalities that organic growers and advocates in the industry have. You know, I don't think this $50 billion industry is going away anytime soon. So. Yep, I agree. Peter, anything to add? 
Sure. I, one thing I do like to add on this one is, is that organic aligns really well with Driscoll's because one of our values is, is humility. And, um, you know, organics is, like I said, is all about um, one of the biggest practices is increasing organic matter in your soil. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's widespread everywhere and uh, or increasing humus in your soil. And the root word of humility and the root word of humus come from the exact same, from the exact same Latin. Um, the etymology is the same for those two, and I just think that that's that's really cool. It's like it's within our own uh, language. You can find those 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 little secret, I don't know, codes of alignment there. Commonalities, yeah, I love that. Thank you for that. And um, you mentioned, you know, increasing organic matter in soil and soil health. It's something that we have spent a lot of time uh, researching and, and a benefit of our um, super six fertilizer products. So forgive the shameless plug. Uh, but if you're interested in learning more about that, you know, check out some of our previous episodes around soil health. Uh, our chief agronomist, Alan Philo has some great episodes on the podcast. So I think we are going to wrap this up, but before we um, sign off, this has been an amazing episode. Thank you both so much. Really, really appreciate the time. I know you're both extremely busy people, um, but if you won't mind, um, let our listeners and viewers know we, we try to help make connections uh, through the Renewables podcast. So how can our listeners and viewers find you online? Um, maybe we'll you know plug the Driscoll's website too, which we'll also include in the show notes. But if anybody wants to get in touch with either of you individually, um, if you wouldn't mind, just are you LinkedIn, Twitter people? Um, and then we will include some things in the show notes that were mentioned in the episode as well. So they're easy to find. Um, and Peter, I'll take you up if you'll send me that paper. Was it the, sure. uh, was it the borough or? Bowls. It's uh, Bowles Tim Bowles. Yeah. 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 Bowles, that would yeah. be awesome. So how can we find you online? I'm on LinkedIn. So you can find me at Emily Musgrave. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. So you can find me there. Send me a message. It's easy. Yep. Yep. I'm on LinkedIn as well and Instagram. So uh, awesome. same name. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks again. This has been a phenomenal episode, really an honor to have Driscoll's represented here on the show. Uh, we really have been centering this show a lot around ag and organic farming. And um, so this is just so topical and, and so appreciate your time today. So Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our listeners and viewers. Make sure to follow Driscoll's on LinkedIn and any other business platforms that you use. And of course, make sure to follow Renewables on Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This has been another episode of Renewables. Thank you and see you next time. Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America.